Okay, so from data-driven marketing and first-party data, which I'm sure we will be coming back to uh, later this morning, uh, we go on to talk about revealing the hidden audience. A uh, provocative title from Burkan Tunabolo, hopefully I pronounced, pronounced that right, Burkan, um, who's the media director for GSK. Um, so without further ado, we will hand over to you, Burkan. Hi, everybody. So this is Barkan Tunaboyo, and you did it right, by the way. Thank you very much for the pronunciation. I'm the media director for Middle East and Africa region and GSK, uh, Consumer Healthcare. And today I'm going to talk about revealing a hidden audience, by the way, by using uh, the power of creative uh, media and measurement. So here we go. First of all, I'd like to start with introducing you the, the Sensodyne. Okay, Sensodyne is the leading sensitivity toothpaste in Turkey, and it's also the value share leader in the market. So when you are the leading brand, leader brand, the driving growth because uh, becomes a, a problem. Uh, it becomes a bit tricky for you because you need to find the new ways to to to, to maximize the penetration, and you need to find your growth audience. And that growth audience for Sensodyne was the less bothered sensitivity sufferers, uh, those people are actually suffering from the sensitivity issue in their, the, in their teeth, but they are not taking any action to treat it. And we are not talking about a small size, by the way. They are actually 40% of the entire sensitivity sufferers audience in the market. So here, co here comes the problem, actually. They are almost invisible online. So what we mean? because they are not involved in the category, because they are not actively searching for a solution to their, con uh, to their condition, to their problem, and they are basically not, not moaning about it on social media, it's almost impossible to find them because they are not leaving any trace, any fingerprint on digital. That's, that was the main problem of, of the brand. So how are we going to reach those people? How are we going to identify those people? We were quite... Uh, pessimistic, I would say, about it. But things started changing when we first met the automated creative team uh, last year. Automated creative team's approach is to turn advertising impressions into marketing intelligence. So they do this by creating ads at huge scale, running sprints and gathering data, gathering signals from those ads to identify the triggers or, or, or to mine some insights. So things start changing when we first met automated creative team. Uh, and after having some brainstorm sessions, we, we came up with this assumption and that assumption actually turned into the solution at the end, we created a threefold model to reveal that audience, the less bothered sensitivity sufferers. We focused on three pillars, the creative with automated creative, the media part with DV360, the, the, the programmatic and Facebook, and also on the measurement part, which is kind of the critical uh, part in this assumption, the solution. We work with uh, Google Analytics and also Lucid. Uh, we designed a custom brand lift study, custom survey, where we implemented a question, custom designed question, to, to, to learn more about the moderation level, uh, as we call, from those people. The first part was the creative part. Uh, we the, uh, the assumption, a part of the assumption is to re redesign the messaging around FOMO, the fear of missing out, to grab their attention because, yes, they are in comfort, but they can simply live with that. So they, they're not taking any proactive, uh, cautious about it. So that's why we try, we, we decided to focus on FOMO. But again, uh, we need some more insights, some more data to build the creative strategy around it. And as a first step, uh, let's, we said that we need to learn. We need to learn about these people. And we run, a, a, again, with the automated creative team, we run a social listening to, to understand the things uh, that people are missing out just because of the situation, just because of sensitive heat. Yes, we, again, focused on the more bothered audience because the other ones are simply not knowing about it. But that could be a... Uh, a way for us to grab their attention. When we learned about their, their motivations, all this, 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 this data points, uh, we themed all of these insights under some groups uh, in order to structure our strategy for creative production. And there were already some interesting 
findings that we just uh, dig out from social, uh, like psychological and social elements. So not only limited to food triggers, but we could also understand that people are psychologically and socially impacted from the situation, which could be a way for us to get in touch with less bothered people. And as the next step, we started creating ads. We created too many ads, hundreds, thousands of ads, different variations using all of these signals. And the, the single idea here is, again, the fear of missing out. We were saying, we said that you may not have sensitivity now, but what happens if you had, or what, what if, if, you, if you don't take any action on this? Uh, and we, we built the, the entire creative strategy around this, this concept. And that was the research part of the campaign. Uh, and to identify the, the best uh, variations, the most performing, the top performing ones, we also designed a test. We reached a broad audience, but with a limited budget, of course. We call this limited broad audience uh, without any filter, without any, uh, without any media choice, touch point choice. We just run out all uh, creatives we had and start gathering data points with the AC team to understand which themes, which groups are performing better and are getting better uh, response uh, from people. Based on these learnings, based on these outcomes, we created a golden list and start the campaign, the real activation. For the real activation, uh, that was something new that we applied for the brand. We created a mass exclusion filter. We excluded all people who have ever engaged with the brand for the last year. We excluded people who have visited our website, who watched our ads, who clicked our, on our ads, who even searched for the category or for the brand or the category or the topic on, on Google. So we excluded all of them. And we reached a brand set of brand new set of people with the assumption that they could be less bothered because they didn't engage with Sansa Diner in the last or or category in the last one year. And guess what? Uh, the the initial results was quite promising and surprising because for the first time we had the connect, we had a contact with less bothered people. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous slides. We designed a custom design BLS on Facebook and on Lucid, asking people about their moderation level. And based on the BLS results, we have seen that actually the 50%, half of the audience we have reached with that campaign, that test, are marked themselves as less bothered. So that was an amazing news for us, first of all, because that was the first uh, real contact uh, with, the, with, the, with those people. But as a next step, uh, we also needed to gather more uh, data from them. So we need to understand who they are, what are their interests, what are their behaviors, uh, what are their demographics maybe. And to do that, by the way, we created, we developed a data mapping model, to connect create, creative, that the, the creative insights that we get from automated creative, the DV360 data, the Facebook data, and also the G, GA360 data, the website data. We connected the dots, we created a model, and that model actually helped us to reveal that audience. Now, Sansoda in Turkey knows about these people. They, we know about their demographics, their interests, and the tonality they would like to hear from Sansodine because that was a, one of the major outcomes that we had. So uh, although they were impacted, although they were attracted by the same triggers, by similar triggers, they were not really uh, attracted or interested in the way uh, Sansodine was communicated, communicating to the audience. So that tonality, the tone of voice uh, was a critical point. And we simply changed that uh, with this campaign. And this is something that we, we will keep applying in the upcoming campaigns as well. So in the test campaign, the results were quite promising, by the way. So we smashed the CTR benchmarks by 5%. And more important than that, uh, we increased the average time spent on the website, the dwell time, by 2x. So clearly, we were able to reach out a more quality audience and a brand new audience. And most importantly, we were able to reach uh, less bothered with this strategy. Now, this is becoming a model for Sansuda in Turkey. And we will keep building on the model to make it even, uh, even better in the 
uh, upcoming period. So actually, that's all from my end. I think I was too quick. No, Verkan, you all right are... on time. No, you're right on time. 15 seconds before the end of your slot. So fantastic. Amazing. <laughs> Look, Verkan, I love that case study. I think it's a wonderful case study to show that actually digital signals aren't always there and sometimes you need to actually go and look for them and find them in order to target audiences. How, where did this start? Was this an initiative driven by GSK, by an audience insight from an agency? I'm just interested in what was the start point for this type of thinking? Starting point was GSK actually. GSK category team, uh, they put this question on the table. So the less bothered, reaching out to less bothered was kind of a million dollar question for the brand because he knew that they were big, but there was also, always a, a blurry area on that front because we couldn't identify them or we couldn't isolate them. So that challenge was put by brand team, even yeah. by category team, by GSK, and we simply found the solution. Interesting. No, no, no it's a great case study. And... You, you obviously, what I think you showed really nicely is that you need to think about the audience, the creative, and the placement. But it, interestingly, you were using programmatic to actually deliver it. So it, it shows that you can yeah. use programmatic technology and all the data and targeting, but you can still use a very traditional planning approach. So could, could you maybe talk about that? Because I think sometimes people think about programmatic as not about planning and just about kind of targeting. Yeah, so programmatic, yes, it could be a, maybe an easy way for people to, 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 to start the autopilot campaigns. And the data could be sometimes too much overcomplicated, but we should not ignore that, that, that fact that data, that digital, is giving us an amazing opportunity to reveal the, the unbiased or, or organic, I would say, uh, insights about those people, and this is something that we managed. So if you run a standard uh, programmatic campaign, you would only be limited to to the data points you have, right. or the data points that's being uh, sold, I, uh, I would say, or marketed by vendors. But yeah. when you combine that part, that 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 precious part, with the creative, with the power of content, and also with the power of measurement, because without measurement, we couldn't do this, by the way. Uh, you start unlocking new new chapters, new maps in the game. So that was the mind opener for us because yeah. we also just like any advisor, we were just applying programmatic for data play, but now we are using programmatic for insight mining. I yeah, which say. which I lo I love I love that. I think that's a great quote. Um, and how did you get the various different parties, agencies to collaborate to make sure that? the creative was well enough tuned to the new audiences and those data triggers that you'd found? It, it, it was the fun part, I guess. It was the fun part because it's not easy. So we, we kept running sprints, a week long sprints each time. Uh, we set up the campaign on a weekly basis and then get together with all parties, the creative and the measurement and the, the media agency, just run through the results identify the top performing ones and fine tune. It was an, it was an easy task and it's not a sustainable model, I would say, but right. in the, this research phase, in the beginning of the campaign, if you can do it, if you can just commit uh, to do that, uh, then it creates a sustainable model, by the way. Currently, for now, we are not talking about uh, running the sprints again. So we right. already created that model. Uh, we're gonna simply set up that model on programmatic and let the machine learning based on our uh, on our strategy. Great. Well, Becca, look, I love I love the planning meeting programmatic. I think it's a great uh, great example that you can bring the two worlds together. So, look, thank you so much for joining us this morning and sharing that case study. Thank you very much.